Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday workshop, where we get together in the middle of the week and learn more about technology. I'm really excited about the presentation we're about to hear right now because it's something I really don't want to know a lot about. I and electricity are just not happy campers together. But uh, today, John Kraut's going to be with us and share some information about surge protection and AC wiring problems, which uh, we all need to know because we got to deal with electronics and electronics can have bad uh, dealings with our equipment if we don't know what we're doing. Most of you know John. John's been one of our regular presenters. He's from, as I have finally learned, the Paddocks Computer Club in the Pat Aces. Pat Aces. See, I, I was going to say it right before and I had it all set to write it. Now, Gabe uh, Goldberg will tell you he pronounces it pay taxes. Uh, <laughs> I'm not particularly fond of that. No, no. John's been writing about creative uses of personal computers since the early 1980s. Now he writes about smartphones, tablets, digital cameras, and we know today he's going to be talking about surge protectors and AC wiring. He retired back in 21 after working as a federal contractor software engineer for over 30 plus years. And he lives in Arlington, Virginia with his son, many computers, digital cameras, and too many cats, and most recently, a flooded basement. So today, turn things over and welcome John back. He's the other John, or maybe it's me. I'm the other John, and he's going to share with us how not to get shocked and all that sort of stuff. Over to you, John. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me just mention this photo behind me I shot in the San Diego Zoo in exactly 45 years ago, in August of 1978. And uh, it's been one of my favorites. It was shot on ectochrome film and then later scanned through a Canon flatbed scanner with a film scanning capability. Uh, so now it's uh, digital. Um, and... Uh, yeah, uh, during the major storms that hit the mid-Atlantic uh, earlier this week, my basement did flood. It's fine now. I only got a couple inches. It's not like the poor uh, woman who, I think she was in a, uh, a flooded cathedral where she got married, and she had to literally walk down the aisle through over a foot of water. So I don't think I got it bad this time around. Um, now, I am about to start the presentation. The first screen you will see will be black. I do that so I can do, change a couple of settings before uh, those settings become uh, blockades so you can't see parts of my screen. Um, there's one unique thing going on among uh, uh, the folks who are uh, signed in today, and that is uh, the woman who's talking on the phone and not looking at her uh, camera or screen. So I hope she will hang up soon because believe me, if the storms come your way, as they may well in the next month or so, you'll need to know this. All right, here we go, we'll uh, share. And there's the black screen. What I'm going to do is make sure that I turn off my floating media controls. There we go. And here's our title. Um, this came up uh, for a very practical reason, which I'll mention in a couple of minutes. Uh, but I, I found out through experience that many, many people have miswired uh, AC power sockets, and that can cause a great deal of grief if you suffer a power surge. Um, and that brings us to why you should care about this topic. First of all, surge protection requires a valid ground connection on a three-wire AC power socket. In many cases, your favorite electronics will work fine on a three-wire AC power socket with no connection to ground. But there's one big exception to that general rule, and that is surge protection. 
what I'm getting at, first of all, is a failure to connect the AC power socket to ground by whoever built your house is effectively invisible during everyday use. You won't know about it because your stuff will work, but surge protection will not work without a valid connection to ground. It's that simple. Uh, when a surge does happen and you are connected to an AC socket with no ground, your connection, your, your protected electronics will most likely be ruined. And that includes HDTVs, computers, routers, monitors, external hard drives, SSDs, stereo gear, charging uh, and any smartphones char uh, or tablets that are connected for charging. And possibly if you have an EV or a pluggable hybrid EV, possibly your car will be harmed as well if it's plugged in and charging. Not only that, but think about any major appliances that you have bought in the past few years, such as a dishwasher uh, or uh, an oven, or for that matter, a fridge. All of those things have substantial electronics built into them, unlike the same products from say 25 years ago. So if the surge protection maker includes a warranty for damage to electronics attached to the surge protection, then that warranty is void if the ground connection on the three wire AC socket is not actually connected to a true ground. All right, I'm gonna take a moment to talk a little bit about the basics of electricity. Um, this is designed for what we might call electricity 101. Um, we have an analogy on your screen now. The water hose analogy for electricity is useful for explaining various concepts such as voltage and current. In general terms, the electricity is water, voltage is the pressure applied to that water, and current is literally the amount of water flowing. So that's how you can think of voltage and current, sometimes called amperage when you're talking about electricity. Electrical current is measured in amperes and is sometimes abbreviated amps or just the letter A. Electrical voltage is measured in volts and that's probably the one that's most familiar to you because we see it all the time. We buy a battery and it's maybe a 1.3 or 1.5 volt battery or a nine volt battery so we've been taught to think about volts for a long, long time. Electrical power is literally watts. And with the way we compute it is volts times amps. And electrical energy is watts applied over a specific time. So we measure that in watt hours and that's computed as watts times the amount of time you use those watts. So that's, that's literally an energy measure that is appears on your electric bill. Now, a brief outline of our agenda, what causes surges? How does surge protection work? Warranties, pretty much giving you the whole skinny on warranties. Miswired AC power sockets are likely widespread. I'll tell you why it all comes down to a, an interesting topic, microeconomics. We'll find out how we can test our AC power sockets to make sure they are uh, properly wired or not. And we'll even talk about the subject that came up when I first presented this for Pat Aces whole house surge protection. I've done a little research on it and I will relay that to you today also. So what causes surges? Um, surges are caused primarily by lightning and by failure of power company equipment. Uh, among that power company equipment, there are transformers. 
And sometimes as transformer ages, uh, you can tell the older ones because they show rust or they sometimes sing, making a humming sound. And aging transformers can fail when peak demand for AC power occurs, such as summertime air conditioning use. And yes, there are parts of this country where that has reached a unique peak this summer, as we all know. Other failures are due to external damage, such as falling trees onto a substation or vehicle crashes that damage ground level transformers or substations. So it's not just in the counties like mine where electricity is delivered through overhead utility lines. It can happen anywhere. Now, I mentioned overhead utility lines. Here's a picture I shot in 2013 during a summer evening thunderstorm, this transformer on US 29, which is now known locally as Langston Boulevard near my house in Arlington, Virginia, died in, how shall I say, photogenic fashion. Um, the power surged and, and died for many blocks around this spot. Uh, and this is about two blocks from my home. And what I did, the power went out, I didn't have anything else I could accomplish, so I grabbed my camera. I followed the sound of sirens, and I took this photo. Um, this is a cylindrical step-down transformer, meaning it reduces voltage and increases amperage. On a pole two doors away from my house, I shot this picture a couple of months ago. During a hot summer evening in 1982, we heard an explosion. And this transform had exploded, our lights went out too. In fact, the lights got very bright for a fraction of a second and then went out. And that fraction of a second was, you guessed it, power surge. Now, when the AC power was restored, we found nine light bulbs in our house had burned out. And here you see the replacement transformer 41 years after that surge event. And yes, you can see the rust. This thing is probably in need of replacement or it will get hit by uh, some demand that it cannot supply and it will decide to give up the ghost. Um, now here's the worst case I ever heard of. This happened in the mid 1980s to a member of our computer club. Uh, surges don't just arrive on your AC power line. They can come in on copper phone lines, if you still have those, and coaxial cable, the old type of cable TV. Um, I've circled the KV, cable TV line here for a reason. This member of our club had set up a, a system which included a VCR and a computer both connected to a large TV set. And in those days, computers did not produce images that had higher resolution than a conventional uh, analog TV set. So this worked out rather well for him, except you'll notice that there are wires connecting all three of these expensive devices. Now, here's what happened to it. Lightning struck the coaxial cable and came in on the connection I show as cable TV line. The surge went through the VCR and through its video cable to the television. The surge went through the TV and through the second video cable to the computer. And here's what that uh, member of our club found. The VCR, the TV, and the computer were all destroyed and had to be replaced. Now, since I mentioned it came in on a copper cable TV line, yes, you can buy a surge protector for that. Yes, you can buy a surge protector for your phone line. And yes, you can even buy a surge protector if you have your internet service coming in on uh, ethernet cable. Now, what do most surges have in common? Well, first of all, summertime. And this is why I suggested this topic to Judy, because this is something 
that we run into most frequently in the summertime. Some involve very high AC power use by air, uh, residential air conditioning. Some involve sun, summer thunderstorms and lightning strikes. Most are very short events, and this particular graph illustrates it. The, what's labeled as normal level is normal AC 120 volt power. Alternating current means it alters between a positive and a negative peak. And the reason we adopted that, by the way, is that it transfers energy across longer, longer uh, supply lines than uh, normal DC power ever could. In fact, uh, Thomas Edison had a lot invested in uh, DC power generation, and he thought AC, he, he tried to convince the public it didn't work, but he tried to convince the public that AC was very risky and dangerous. And until about the mid 90s, there were still a few customers using Edison's old direct current uh, supply lines in Manhattan, but they eventually all converted. So in this illustration, you see that uh, AC power, which operates on a frequency of 60 Hertz, uh, you can see, uh, and that means each wave is 1 60th of a second long. You can see that the spike, what we call a voltage spike or a power surge, uh, is usually much shorter. It's a very short event and usually at much higher voltage. Here, I would guess it looks like 350 or 400 volts, but it could be even higher. Now, there's some trends we need to acknowledge. First of all, summers will continue to get hotter. Air conditioning will be used for more weeks and will fight hotter air. Certainly people in the Southern US have learned that already this summer. Newer home computer power supplies demand more AC power, a lot more than when uh, that transformer uh, blew up outside my house 41 years ago. And uh, uh, we were running a computer at the time, an eight bit computer, and oddly enough, it had a rock solid power supply that survived the spike. So that computer wasn't damaged. HD TVs demand more AC power than the old analog cathode ray tube televisions. Electric cars and pluggable hybrid electric cars like the one I own demand more AC power as well. So next thing we're gonna look at is how does surge protection work? This is very important. Um, I have an, uh, on this computer that I'm using for my presentation today, I have an uninterruptible power supply, a UPS. And almost every one sold in the United States includes surge protection. And many of those offer a warranty for damage to connected equipment if the surge protection fails to block a surge. It can be very valuable. So if your computer is damaged, it would provide more than enough money to, uh, to replace the computer, uh, the monitor, and anything else that you have hooked up. Now, many power strips also include surge protection. Mostly these do not offer a surge protection warranty. A few that I own have a reset button. I call these reusable. When the reset button, when, when the, uh, the power strip blocks a surge, it provides a convenient reset button so that you can use the power strip and the surge protection again. And then there's the single use. And most UPS devices have no button to, for reset. When a surge occurs, the surge protection feature in the UPS no longer works and you need to replace the product. Now, those kinds of devices where you need to replace the product after it blocks a surge protection, use a component called a metal oxide varistor. Remember this acronym MOV because you'll probably see it. Um, 
on the packaging of a uninterruptible power supply. The MOV detects a voltage spike and effectively burns out. And what that means is that the voltage spike is then routed directly to ground. There's that word again, ground. It means something that's connected literally to the earth beneath your feet or beneath your house. While doing that, the MOV also permanently breaks the normal AC path to the UPS or power supply. So you buy a replacement. And think of it this way. The replacement is much less expensive than replacing the electronics protected by the UPS or power strip. Now, both of those types, the types with the reset button and the types with the MOV, they both send surges to ground. This is why a valid ground connection on an eighth AC three wire power socket is so important because if the surge comes in and there's no ground, where does it go? I'll give you one hint, it goes to your computer. The lack of a valid ground connection is completely invisible to your eye. Electrical devices often work fine with no ground on the three wire socket. When a valid ground connection is lacking, a surge will damage the surge protection itself, may damage your connected equipment. So, as I mentioned before, surge protection built into a UPS usually provides a warranty with a very high dollar ceiling. It may be $25,000 or more to pay for any connected equipment damaged by a surge that the surge protection feature fails to block. But the warranties require that the UPS be properly connected to ground. If you want to ensure your surge protection works and that the warranty covers your loss, if the surge protection does not work, then make sure your AC socket has a valid connection to ground. I'm going to show you how to determine that. Now, this is why I got interested in this subject. For many years, I have used a UPS, including surge protection, for my computer and the related gear connected to the computer. Uh, I have a diagram here showing uh, a, uh, an AC socket with three connections, one for neutral, one for hot, and one for ground. I call this the face, by the way, because it looks like somebody who's frowning. I decided to add a UPS to my router recently, my router is not in the same place as my computer. My computer and uh, my uh, webcam and my lighting and my monitor, they're all sitting here in my basement dungeon with me. Uh, this week it became my basement swamped dungeon, but we fixed that part. Um, my UPS is now, uh, my router is now in the living room because that's central to the house and that gives best Wi-Fi distribution to every room in every part of the house. Basement, main floor, top floor. Computer, as I mentioned, the computer's in the basement. So I researched surge protection and learned that all types require a valid ground contact through a three-wire AC socket. And the ground contact, as I've noted here in the illustration, is the mouth of the socket face. Now, it turned out I had a very valuable resource available and I didn't know it. My son has diagnosed and fixed many AC socket wiring mistakes at his girlfriend's house. That house was in nearby Reston, Virginia, and it was built in the 1970s. My house, by the way, was built in the 40s. Now, more than half of the sockets in his girlfriend's townhouse were miswired, and he managed to fix them. He bought a book, he's, he's wonderful at self-education, and he bought a book called Wiring Simplified at Home Depot, and that got him on the road to becoming a very, very talented and knowledgeable electrician. I asked him to look at the router's AC socket in my home and later at all of the sockets in my home. Mine was built in the late 40s, as I mentioned, 
the router's AC socket had a disconnected ground on it. And as it turns out, more than half of the sockets in my home were miswired. So my son fixed all of the AC socket miswiring in my home. Fixing that ground on that socket for the router was a special difficulty. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, why does what, the real question here, I think for most of us, to understand this and how it affects you individually is to ask the question, why does it happen? Why does miswiring happen on your AC power uh, wires in your home? And I'm gonna use sort of an analogy. Um, this goes back a long way. This is a photo of a famous construction collapse not far from where I live. This was an area called Skyline Towers. And one of the buildings that was being uh, constructed there in 1973 collapsed. And this was just on the southeast side of the intersection of George Mason Drive and Virginia Route 7. I mentioned that because what's next door, a little bit to the east, was a McDonald's, and it became the most popular McDonald's in America in terms of dollar value for the next couple of years because people came to look at this disaster and maybe have a Big Mac or ice cream or whatever. Uh, and I was in college at the time, and another building under construction in Boston, I found out, also collapsed. And since I was an architecture major, I asked my architecture department advisor why buildings collapsed. And his first word was bribery. Huh? Well, I'm going to explain that too. Um, buildings are often produced on borrowed money. A prime contractor borrows money to do the construction work. Contractor counts on payments or possible one payment or possibly multiple uh, progress payments from the developer to pay off that loan. You know, the major problem is that cons construction can be delayed by many things, and that includes weather, strikes, supplier problems. A construction loan leads to time pressure. So you have to meet or beat deadlines so that the prime contractor can be paid and so that prime contractor can pay off the loan on time because banks don't care what delayed you. They care about payments on time. If the prime contractor falls behind schedule, which is actually fairly common, he may seek to bribe the building inspector to allow concrete to be poured for an upper floor before the prior floors are completely dried out and ready to provide maximum support. So you see how bribery factors in? Um, now, my house was built in the 40s when nobody wired for three-wire AC service. So the original wiring to the floor that was fully developed, which was the main floor, was two-wire. And that two-wire socket was installed in the late 40s when the house was being constructed. A later contractor hired by my wife installed a three-wire AC socket in that same spot, but did not connect a ground wire to that socket. And I found out why. There was no ground wire running through that wall. My son learned the same thing, and he installed a ground wire from a three-wire junction box in the basement ceiling just below that wall, up through the wall to the router socket. And then he connected that wire to the appropriate uh, connection for ground on that socket. Uh, as it turns out, in that part of the basement, we had no ceiling tiles. That's the utility room. And so installation did not disrupt any ceiling tiles. If it had, I would have paid quite a bit to get those tiles replaced. So all in all, it was a very economical upgrade of our AC service in that one socket. Okay, now, let's see if I can get to the next slide. There it is. 
I believe that the same economics issue faces every home builder and their electrical contractors. Get it done quick is a nice way to summarize it. That leads to less than complete attention to details like connecting a ground wire to a three wire AC socket. Now, that's, as I said, originally in my house at Cape Cod on my block, I knew that the top floor and basement were unfinished when the house was first built and sold. I have seen that in other houses on the same block. And as it happens, I can see five different type of alternating current cables installed on our breaker box, and that implied five different ways of installation. And in every case, oh, now here's the way I intended to show that slide. There we go. Um, and here's yet another, okay, I gotta fix this. Um, so, and we can skip that. We can skip that. There's another way to connect a three wire cable coming out of your computer to a two wire socket. Don't upgrade the socket, use a cheater plug like I, the one I've depicted here. And the metal tab on the cheater plug allows you to connect the third wire to a valid ground. And most people don't bother. You can understand why I call this a cheater adapter. Okay, now we're gonna take a moment to dive into another type of issue called short circuits. And I'm gonna start with something that I did when I was eight years old, and I urge you not to do this. Um, a normal connection of a three wire socket to an appliance or an electronics like your computer draws just enough current to power the appliance or electronics. In other words, the device itself limits the amount of current that it will draw. But if you stick a wire into the neutral and hot uh, contacts, that's called a short circuit. And what happens when you do that? Aside from blowing out, uh, you know, turning off power in a good part of your house, the breaker shuts down. And the reason is if it didn't shut down, then it's possible that electric uh, wires inside your wall would start to burn. And of course, we don't want that to happen. Now, the major thing uh, takeaway from this is Short circuits normally happen inside the residence, not outside. Um, fuses and breakers do stop short circuits, but they do not stop spikes. Voltage spikes are a different thing completely. Um, short circuits draw a tremendous current, but do not affect AC voltage. And if allowed to continue, as I mentioned, uh, short circuits can start fires. Now this device, which is also de depicted by, behind Judy, uh, is called a ground fault circuit interrupter. And this is a newer type of AC uh, socket pair uh, that is widely used now. Uh, and it happens to serve exactly the same purpose as a breaker or fuse, it will stop a short circuit. And you can see two buttons on it. One of them is called test, one of them is called reset. You press test to make sure the thing is still working. You press reset after it works or after the test. So with these devices properly connected inside your home in AC sockets, it will limit the effect of a short circuit to a much smaller area than the area served by a given breaker. And that makes it easier on you because it doesn't impact you across a huge area of your home. Okay, now let's talk about how you can find out 
if your AC socket for your computer or your other electronics is properly connected to ground. It turns out it's not very expensive. These devices are can be found on Home Depot, uh, Lowe's, and on Amazon. Here's one that I bought recently. Now, they're usually labeled on their front face, which is the top face when you plug it into a normally oriented AC socket, with a table like the one you see here. I bought this one at Home Depot, as it happens. Uh, the device claims to identify a three-wire AC socket with correct wiring and several miswirings. As you can see here, they list one, two, three, four, five, six different states. One of them is correct, and five of them are various miswirings. Now, electricians will tell you that it doesn't do an accurate job of diagnosing those other five, but it will do an accurate job of telling you that your AC socket is properly wired. And when that happens, you can see on this device at the bottom, there are three translucent plastic pieces that actually are, uh, provide uh, uh, visibility of LEDs. And so if the wiring is completely correct, the two yellow ones on the right will light up. So that's an easy way to test your AC socket for proper grounding. If you see any of the other symbols, you can guess that something's wrong, but you really need an electrician to diagnose it properly. So, um, as I said just now, if the lights indicate that your AC socket is correctly wired, you're good. If they are not correctly wired, you can consider hiring an electrician to fix them. Or you can go through the education process that my son did with that wonderful book. But there is another opportunity for you to do this inexpensively, not necessarily on your own, and that's called whole house surge protection. This was first brought to my attention when I presented this uh, topic for Pat Aces, and then I went and researched it on the web. It's very interesting. Uh, if you have access to your breaker box or fuse box, which is common in single family homes, but not in apart apartments or condos, an electrician can add a surge protector at the point where AC power enters the breaker box long before it gets to an AC socket. Such surge protectors are commonly called whole house surge protectors. These protect everything connected to power, everything, including your lights, modern appliances, your computer, and everything else. And yes, they come with warranties. Now here's an example. This is, the brand name is Square D. This model is HEPD50, and it's made by Schneider and it's sold at Home Depot. This one, the price a uh, couple days ago in August was $113. It includes a $50,000 warranty for three years from the date of purchase. And like any warranty, I suggest you keep your receipt or a photo of it so that you can prove that you bought it. This device has a very simple user interface. It as I mentioned, it blocks surges up to 50,000 amps. And there's another model, a bit more expensive, that blocks 80,000 amp surges and includes a $75,000 warranty. Now, we're gonna take a little closer look at this device. It uses an MOV, a move, just like surge protectors in UPS devices. And when the surge protector uh, blocks the voltage spike, the move burns out and routes that voltage spike to ground so it doesn't reach any of your uh, precious devices, expensive devices. Uh, the LED on the device has two positions, OK and replace. 
when replace lights up, you need to replace this surge protector. But consider once again, it's a lot less expensive than all the things it protected. Now, interesting, this one does not shut down AC power when it, uh, it blocks a spike. So the AC power to your home continues. I want to mention, I'm done now, and I'm going to mention a preview of something else I'm going to present in the near future that might be of interest to you, particularly if you're considering getting an electric vehicle such an, as an EV or what I have a pluggable hybrid, which is called a PHEV. I'm going to be doing this on Saturday, August 19th at 1 p.m., for uh, the Potomac Area Technology and Computer Society, and there's its webpage address. Um, I think of this, when I started working on this, I thought of comparing gasoline and electric vehicle operating costs as apples and oranges. It turns out there's an easy way to do it, and that's what I'm gonna show people. Now, the other interesting thing is you're going to find out just how much less it costs to operate an electric vehicle compared to a gasoline vehicle. You can see this presentation via Zoom. Send your full name, your user group name, and your city and state of residence to this email address. Now, if you happen to be able to scan a QR code, you can scan this QR code with your smartphone, and that will automatically create an email with the recipient address, the topic, and most of the text body, but you must still fill in the spaces that are labeled in that email for your full name, your user group name, and your city and state. I put a couple of things here at the bottom, just in case you wanna save this on your computer. If you have a Windows computer, all you have to do is tap, hold down the Windows key and tap print screen, and that will store this entire slide in the screenshots folder, which is a subfolder of your pictures folder. Now on a Mac, if you have one of those, you hold down two keys, shift and command, and then tap the number three. And that will store this entire slide in the desktop folder. I wrote desktop older. I wrote this at about 11.30 this morning, just before I had to get on this meeting. I guess I'll have to fix that typo. Um, and that's it, folks. So we're at the end. I'm going to stop the screen share and take questions. There we go. I want to give a shout out to Gabe and Henry and uh, let's see, Gary. All three of those members of our Pat Aces user group are on the meeting today. Very interesting, John. I still don't want to touch it. John, can you, John Kennedy, uh, will you let us know how you take a screenshot? You, the Linux people could have taken a screenshot of that slide. Print screen. Okay, just plain old print screen. I have been told by other Linux users that it varies from one uh, publisher of Linux to another, but I know on my Raspberry Pi 400, print screen does it. Yes, like John said. Yeah. If, if you add usually a different uh, screen capture program, it might be a little bit different, but usually it's print screen. But I'll still say, John, I'm not going to touch it. Okay. I have <laughs> questions and comments. Uh, Jay says, to avoid surge from ground due to a lightning strike close to the house, he unplugs everything that you talked about when a storm is coming uh, as per weather people recommending that. Several years ago, when they had a telephone-based system, a lightning strike fried my modem. The lightning strike was about 10 to 15 feet away. We don't have lightning hardly at all in California. Good for Oh, us. you lucky people. Um, I, oh, and, he, and Christopher says he owns several high-end APC battery backups with surge protection. He also has a whole house surge protector between the electric meter and his home that was installed by Duke Energy. What is your opinion of whole house surge protectors? Uh, this is a new topic uh, for me personally. Uh, my gut reaction to it is that it covers 
all sorts of miswiring issues because it traps uh, the surge before it gets to uh, your AC socket. So if you think, um, and I might add, give, based on my experience, most of you should assume that many of your AC sockets are in fact miswired. If you think that's the case, then I think the least expensive thing you can do is have a whole house surge protector installed. Now, if you don't have, if you're in a condo or an apartment and you don't have access to your own um, fuse box or circuit or, or breaker box, then you're effectively uh, not possible, it's effectively not possible to install that whole house surge protector. Um, but uh, it, I think for those of you who are in the position of having to do that, or, or, or it's possible for you to do that in whole house installation, I'd recommend it. Um, and one of the reasons is that you probably don't have a surge protector on your fridge, your clothes washer, your dishwasher, uh, your oven, or anything else that has electronics in it for control purposes. So I think uh, the whole house approach is very, very valuable. Um, having said that, there's one little gotcha. If you don't walk by your fuse box or your breaker box where the device is installed on a daily basis, and it happens to trap a surge while you're not at home and you don't see the lights go crazy uh, or you don't hear the, ex the explosion of the uh, step-down transformer outside your home, you may not know that it blocked a surge and has to be replaced. Um, ideally, I think they ought to build these things with a capability to notify you through a text message or an email that uh, the, uh, it blocked the surge. I don't think squ the Square D brand offers that. It may be that some other brand offers that. I have not been able to find it yet. But in my case, it turns out the breaker box is right next to the clothes washer and dryer and I'm in there almost every day. So I would be able to spot it. But I don't think, um, let me put it this way. Most people are in, in the habit of checking their breakers frequently. So uh, if you do install whole house surge protection, I suggest you get in that habit. Check it at least once a day. Uh, I know Belkin for one has the connected equipment warranty that it covers your equipment that is damaged if their surge protector should fail. So when you are buying a surge protector, please check out and see whether it, that particular one has a warranty. Not all of Belkin's do. My house has all Belkin with the um, warranty. Plus I have a search for uh, UPS. Uh, uh, let me, let Michael me mention, says, please me. remember, register your UPS after purchase with the equipment vendor for the warranty to be valid. And that would be the same with your little surge protectors. Yep. Um, why, aside from cost, uh, isn't search, aren't surge protection, protectors routinely built into electronic devices? Um, okay, I think that's a, a microeconomics issue also, and let me explain it this way. Uh, there's, a, there's a tremendous advantage to minimizing the number of parts in a given consumer electronics device. And the reason for that is very simple. You minim when you minimize the number of parts, you also minimize the cost of making it. Now, do I think that everything, the power supply should have this? Yes. Do I think it's economically likely? Absolutely not. And it's simply a matter of minimizing the cost of the device. Anybody who's bought a fridge that costs $1,500 understands why they wouldn't want to pay an extra 50 or 100 for that extra set of parts.
Uh, what if the outlet does have the ground wire connected? How can you be sure that the ground wire really connects to a valid ground somewhere? Well, I answered that in the presentation. You buy that $8 device and you check the socket. Okay. And uh, then about GFCIs are not native current finding devices. Please don't confuse them with fuses and circuit breakers. How often should one replace an APC UPS unit due to its normal wear and tear? Um, I'd take a look at the warranty and see if it has a time limit. And then I'd use that time limit to answer that question. Please discuss options to protect equipment from spikes on cable TV and telephone lines. Is it important to plug all equipment connected together by video, audio, et cetera, to the same Oh, he used the wrong word. He said power strip. That should be search protector. Yes. Um, okay. What I have found is you can go on Amazon, for instance, and search for a, a search protection for a particular device, such as a phone line. They exist. Ethernet cable. Those exist too. In fact, so um, I have a uh, UPS here with a surge protector that does provide two sockets for Ethernet, one coming in from the outside of my house and the other one going to my equipment, and it has a surge protector in between those two sockets. The only problem is it's not fast enough Ethernet. Now, I have 300 roughly 320 inbound and 360 outbound speeds. And when I plugged it in to that surge protecting capability, it dropped to about 100 megabits. Then I called the manufacturer and found out, well, the thing was designed about five years early and nobody had 300 megabit service at the time. So they built it to 100 megabits. You can buy one on Amazon that will give you gigabit protection. I have not looked into uh, the protection for video cable uh, service. Uh, one of the reasons is that I, I eliminated the video cable 20 years ago and went to optical fiber for that service. And as it turns out, optical fiber does not carry surges into the home. If it hit the box on the outside of my house, if lightning hit that box, it would come in on the ethernet from that box into my home. But that's such a small area that I think the, the risk is tolerable. Maybe it's, the, it's, it's an unlikely hit. Um, beyond that, I don't know. Uh, it, I, clearly the ethernet situation is the most aggravating because like I said, it's, it's on the uh, trip light UPS I have here on my desk, but it doesn't work because it blocks most of my bandwidth. I have gotten our local Best Buy to say to people who buy smart TVs, before you leave the store, you really need to buy a surge protector. I've told any, I tell anybody, you know, you go out with two things at a minimum and one of them is a good surge protector for every single smart TV in your house. Yep. And um, John has closed the uh, chat box, but I'm going to say, those of you who sent your questions to John Kennedy, John Kennedy and Judy Talor are two different people. John's the moderator. I'm the chat box person. He has to take the time to then forward it, so to speak, to me. So as I say, it's easier dealing with preschoolers and kindergartens because they pay attention to instructions. Gabe Goldberg, you are on. Hi, thanks. Two very great presentations. One minor correction. I'm not the one who says pay taxes. I call it tax. Yeah. Somebody else calls it pay taxes. Uh, a question on the whole house surge protector. Uh, for a lightning storm that goes on for a while, you might very well have multiple 
surges. Does that mean you get one shot at protection and then your house melts? Uh, Oddly enough, uh, Gabe, I, when I was doing the research, I came across a competing product, which as you might suspect, is going to be more expensive. From is branded GE, uh, and it contains multiple MOVs. One blows out, you still got some sitting there. But it's the only brand I've, well, it was the other brand that was available on the Home Depot website, and that's why I looked at it. I uh, wondered why it was more expensive. Well, now we know. MOVs are not cheap. Related to whole house protection, we just had our annual electrician inspection, which gets thrown in with the monthly maintenance that uh, we pay. And we were offered whole house protection for quite a lot more than the $100, $200 units that you were talking about. And so I wonder, I suspect uh, if you have an electrician do it, you might get something higher end um, that would give you better protection. Now, I think what you're getting is the fee for the electrician wrapped into the fee uh, with the fee for the product. Uh, electricians, when I was a kid, were probably not living a middle class life, but boy, are they living a nice middle class life now. And the reason is the price has gone up. Just like house visits from doctors used to be a normal thing, and now it's, a, it's kind of rare. And it's because it costs too much to get out of the office. So my, my gut reaction to that is that you're paying for not just, well, another way to put it is this, simply. Um, they hired a guy to come in to do a repair on a submarine. And his bill was for it was $50,000. And so they asked him to itemize it. It was $5 for tapping in the right place and $49,995 for knowing the right place. So you're, you're paying a fee for expertise when you hire an electrician. Well, it's, since, since we were not planning to do that project immediately, I didn't drill down for details, but I think the next time he comes in, I'll ask for specs on the device that he proposes to install and then ask that question, whether it has the MOV that uh, is a one-time use or whether it has something uh, a little bit more robust. And just to tie two things together that you said, the whole house protection protects you from evil coming in through your power supply, but you're still vulnerable to all the other wires, any, any copper, any uh, conduit that can bring a, a lightning hit in on your, your phone line, your coax cable, whole house protection doesn't do anything on those. Yes, you're correct. The only reason I've been able to dodge that is because I have internet and phone coming in on optical cable uh, to the outside of my house. Sure, so, but it's just it's just worth worth remembering that caveat that uh, the whole house protector gives you a lot of protection, but not universal. And and just going back to the first presentation on the SD cards, uh, somebody mentioned. Uh, uh, dash cams in cars. I just installed dash cams in my car and my wife's car, and I bought a truly wonderful uh, dash cam system for both cars on Amazon. And uh, the description on Amazon very, very emphatically described which SD card to buy and which whole bunch of SD cards not to buy. And so what I bought was a 256 gigabyte card uh meeting the specs of the dash cam and that cost about 30 bucks yeah and and so that's 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 pretty economical and uh just love the dash cam there there it has a front and rear facing camera and i've looked at the entertaining videos that it captures and now i'm waiting for something somebody to do something evil and stupid in front of me and or back of me for that matter and then i'll have uh, wonderful evidence so anyway uh, two two great presentations I would comment on that. Folks, there still exist dash cams that do not shoot in full high definition. And believe me, if you want to be able to read uh, a 
uh, license plate in front of your car in that video shot by that dash cam, you better have full high def. The other ones aren't worth having. Steve Parker, you're on. Hi. Um, the GFI tester, um, it also indicates the, um, the other wires on the circuit, um, which just means that whoever installed it may not know the difference between black and white or silver and gold. Um, if those are switched, what is the worst that could happen? Um... I don't have a solid answer for that. We did find some in my home and my son's girlfriend's home that had the hot and neutral switched. Yeah, I, I did too. And again, that's largely invisible to you as a consumer because it will not affect how your appliances and other electronics work during except normal for, operations. Except for your UPS. <sighs> Yeah, your UPS shows an indicator that there's a wiring fault. And I tested it, and sure enough, the idiot that put the thing in it didn't know black from white. Um, May I? Yes, very true. true. May I address that question, please? Absolutely. Okay, if, if, if the hot and neutral are reversed, and you plug a device into them, okay, that happens to actually use the ground, then that part of the device that's normally grounded, like the outside shell of a, of a light bulb socket or the chassis of a device becomes hot, okay? Now, anybody in contact with that and also a ground, water pipe, what, what have you, okay, is now subject to electrocution. Uh, now, Kurt's right. Um, it happened that every one of the hot neutral reverses that we had found in my home and in my son's girlfriend's home had no ground connected. Um, so that risk was minimized. I won't say it's zero, but it was minimized. Um, the ground does not have to be coming through that that ground wire. Uh, you're right, and and you're right. Uh, that can be that can cause electrocution in some circumstances. Uh, as it happens, my son, who is a bit shorter than I am, he's uh, I think five one, um, wears insulated boots with insulated soles, uh, at, uh, constantly just to give him an extra inch. So he didn't get electrocuted when he was messing around with this stuff, although he admitted he came close a couple of times. Yuck. Murray. Uh, oh. I, okay, thanks. I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe put that information about the Potomac uh, uh, meeting in the chat or put that slide up again so I can try again to do the print uh, screen. All of you, uh, well, I'll put it up if, if Judy is okay with it, but the main thing I wanted to say is that you will all receive a PDF copy of the presentation. Uh, I will probably get that out to Judy within the next 24 hours. And then those of you who have properly identified yourselves in your screen names, I'm looking at you, Mike and Camarillo, um, uh, we'll receive a copy of that PDF. Okay. And then the other question I have is, are there any of those whole house protection uh, units that have a, a replaceable MLV so you don't have to buy a whole new surge protector? Um, it wouldn't surprise me. I didn't come across any because I, see, I, I presented this last month for my uh, user group. And uh, I only I went on vacation. I've only had a couple of days to, to do the research before uh, preparing this presentation for today. It wouldn't surprise me if such a thing exists, but I'll tell you what, you don't dare 
do those replacements yourself because you're exposing yourself to the voltage and tremendous possible amperage that comes into your home. Um, there might be a modular system that allows you to plug it into a socket on the side of the, of the surge protector. I don't really know. Um, somebody may have come up with a safe system that allows you to do just that. I would guess that their MOVs will cost you about as much as the original device. Yes, like most consumer electronics, uh, to replace a few parts costs more than to buy a new one. Yes. Another way to look at it is where do they make their money? Hewlett Packard does not make money on selling printers. They make money on selling ink. And that's because you use it up so frequently. I don't expect you'll use up a move very frequently, which is why I think when you buy a replacement, it's going to cost as much as the original uh, surge protector unit. Jim, please unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. I think the GFCI that you mentioned, um, you only need one of those per circuit. It, it protects the circuit, not the, uh, not the individual. Thing. You're correct, but the real reason that it's used is not sim uh, simply one for each circuit, it's one for each part of the house and the idea is that it blocks um, a, a short circuit and limits the effect of the blockade to that one part of the house. So in my opinion, although my son has designed, has installed some that protect a number of uh, sockets downstream, so to speak, from the GFCI, um, there's two reasons why I think you need more GFCIs. One is so that, yes, it, uh, it limits the effect of cutting off the electricity to one room, for instance. And the other one is sort of a public relations issue. If you're going to sell your house, the more GFCIs that people can see, the more comfortable they are. And so uh, I think most, um, most people would say, install more than one per breaker circuit, yes. Well, what I'm saying is, is that like, like in my house, there's there's a lot of, the there are more circuits than just one. The, the circuits are by, by area of the house, generally speaking. And the circuits for the bathrooms are the and the kitchen areas are the ones where these GFCIs were, would be helpful because they have an immediate cutoff without breaking yep. the circuit breaker or this without is, causing the circuit breaker to break. This is true, but it's not true in every house. Now, for instance, in mine, remember I told you there were five waves of installation and some of these circuits serve part of a room and part of another room, part of a third room. And do I want all those rooms cut off if a GFCI is tripped? No. This is why I argue that you really have to know what your circuit layout is and decide based on a number of issues whether you want um, one or two in each room if, you, if it's served by two, two breaker circuits. Um, it's, it's a far more complex question when you face um, a, uh, a, a complex spaghetti of uh, circuits in your home like I have. Can we please separate this idea that GFCIs are current limiting devices. Okay, they are a safety device. True. Safety function is not against spikes. As I mentioned in my presentation, yes. Short circuit protection does nothing to protect from uh, surges or what we call voltage spikes. Nothing. Now, current implementations would have you putting uh, GFCI breakers in the breaker box, which protects everything on that circuit. The type that you showed protects everything in that receptacle that you've got and anything wired downstream from it. It does not protect the circuit. And it's a really big difference. 
Yes, and the point of having a breaker is precisely to protect the circuit from short circuits. It's it to is. protect people from getting electrocuted. It's a safety issue. GFCIs. I think yeah. I, I think I said that too, and that's why I said but don't. That's do its it. primary purpose. And I think I said that too. I don't remember you saying that. I don't either. <laughs> Okay, but you guys can check it out when you get the presentation. Over to Pam Selby. Maybe she's walking the dog. No, she's unmuted herself. Pam, do you have a comment or a question? Pam, as you might guess, we cannot hear you. What do you think, Bill? Oh, God, you're muted too. Okay, we'll move on to Dale. I don't know. My, mine's a simple question. Um, you, you said those, what is it called? Those, those uh, little plugs that you put in your wall and they're like a... Cheater. Cheater, that's it. Cheater, cheater plug. That little round um, metal thing you said has to go somewhere. Exactly where, where do you put it? You have to find a valid ground and connect it to that, but that, it may be nowhere near the particular socket you're using it on. It screws in It screws in to the, with the same screw that holds the cover plate on. No, that is what it's intended for. But if the, if the cover plate and the metal casing behind it is not grounded, Connecting it to that screw does you no good whatsoever. I, I would agree with it. One, one point that I would like to make, and why I put my hand up about three times, okay? Older systems, like the home I was living in now was built in the 60s, okay? Was built using a form of flexible metal conduit. We call it Greenfield. There are other implementations of flexible conduit, conduit that I really hate to work with called BX, okay? The code at the time, okay, allowed the ground to be carried on that conduit. So the fact that you take and you pull a socket out of the wall and you only find two wires on it does not necessarily mean that when it's in its normal operating location. That would help. Somebody stomped on top of me, and I don't know what they said. Yeah, I think Pam finally figured out how to make herself heard. Oh, you can hear me now? Yeah, I'm gonna, and I'll call okay, you. Okay, I'll mute. I'll mute. Hold on. Somebody else is talking. I'll, I'll let you know when it's going to be your turn, and you'll be next. Kurt, are you finished? Do you well, have <laughs> if I've gotten that point across, uh, that if you're putting in something new now, the method that was used in my house does not meet code, okay? But that wiring that was in pre-existing wiring does, and we can assume that the ground is good. As it happens, one of the five ways used BX in my home. So there's some, at least one of those ways used something that I had never seen before. And I don't know what to call it. If my house is built in, uh... 54. How do I check out what kind of wire? Take, want, take it apart and look? No, 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 don't do that. Use the $8 device that I showed you in my presentation. Plug it into the socket. It'll either light up with two yellows on the right, which oh. means you've got good wiring, or it will light up with something else, which means you don't have good wiring. And then talk uh, to the electrician. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have good lighting, you call an electrician to get it fixed. If you don't have good wire. Yeah. Okay, Pam Selby, you're on. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I have just three quick questions. One is um, I get these emails that's showing a device that you can plug in anywhere in your house and it's supposed to save you electricity. <laughs> it's supposed to take out the surging. Um, is that 
Thomas, I just saw you bend over laughing. I have no idea. Um, I have not tested those devices. They sound like scams to me. Maybe somebody on this call has had a different experience, but Thomas is nodding his head vigorously. Thank you, Al. Okay, so the next question is on the GFCI, the newer ones, they seem to have some kind of a plate that moves across the, the places that you plug into. Um, so when you try to plug in something like my computer uh, plug, I have to wiggle a lot for that uh, plate to move. Does that mean it's malfunctioning and I need to have somebody replace it? Or do you, you just gotta put up with it and keep wiggling? Those are currently required. They're a safety function to prevent kids from sticking things in outlets. <laughs> like John did. Like John did at AJ, yeah. Okay, so- And, and that, was a, that was a two wire socket, by the way. That what, tells you roughly how old I am. What am I doing wrong that it won't the plug won't plug in then? It's like it's not synced. You you might want to make sure that that you're holding it straight so that the ground pin, the big the big round one, enters first. It's a little bit longer, and in this application, its function is to open the gate for everything else. Okay, that's good to know. All right. And then my last question is, I have an outside GP, GFCI, and it seems to, um, any of the plugs on the backside of my house outside, if I'm using like a air compressor or something, sometimes um, it blows it and I have to go reset it on that one plug. Is that because one of the plugs is bad along no, the outside? No because you've got a short somewhere and you've got a current flow and yeah. that's what it's detecting. So yeah, that's an unsafe. To, um... High power devices like air compressors draw a lot of current and it, you just may have drawn enough that it convinced the GFCI that you had a short when you really didn't. Of course, you might have really had a short also. I have two GFCIs on the outside of my house one was installed by a competent electrician and it is designed for outdoor use, exposure to rainwater and so forth. It's tripped several times this summer. I do not know why, but it's easy enough to reset. I use that one to charge my uh, PHEV car. The other one was installed by a contractor who put lights in every step of the 17 steps leading up to my house when they replaced the steps. They used an indoor one. It's no longer working. If you get one installed in the outdoors, make sure your electrician puts in the outdoor grade GFCI. Sandy, please unmute yourself and it's good to see you and have you here. Hi, um, I wanted to point out in Southern California, we don't have lightning, but we do have a ton of fly-by-night solar companies. So when I had to get my clothes washer repaired, the repairman pulled up to the house and the first thing he said is, how long have you had the solar? And he explained to me that he's had a lot of appliances repairs to people that had recently gotten solar. Fortunately, we already had a whole house surge protector. So it was just the clothes washer. Uh, but be careful when you have solar installed, make sure that it's from a reputable company. Uh, Let me assure you that the experience of fly-by-night solar uh, installation uh, operations is not solely isolated to Southern California. Mm -hmm. It abounds throughout the United States. And please make sure if you are buying solar, you get it from a reputable company who has a information that they have protection against hackers getting in because the no-name solar people apparently don't. And that's just another way for your home automation, so to speak, stuff to get hacked. And so you've got two things, two extra things to worry about if you're looking for solar. 
Bill James, you're on. I was just wondering if anyone is familiar with Ting, T-I-N-G. It's made by Whistler Labs. And it was offered to me by State Forum as a freebie. And it is a sensor that I plug into an electrical outlet and it monitors my entire electrical network, including loose connections, damaged wires, faulty appliances, and so on. Uh, there's a paid version, but I can monitor it from my phone. And it shows um, the, um, I don't know if you can see it or not, but anyway, it shows the, um, Perfect. Uh, it, it shows the, um, the um, electrical wiring and it's all green and then it gives also the number of votes that's coming into the house. It's offered as a freebie for those people that have state form insurance. Or uh, you can also go out and subscribe to it. Uh, it's T-I-N-G and it's made by Whistler Labs. Are they monitoring, is State Farm monitoring this also? Kind of like how OG and E can monitor how much gas or uh, not gas electric now that i don't know it only it's only um it is it is an internet um of things it's plugged into and is connected to my wi-fi but um anyway um it's just something that uh, is offered for free but you can there is a, a um, subscription that you can um also purchase but for state form insurance people, it's a freebie. Okay. And the other thing here in Oklahoma, uh, GFCIs is a code requirement for all wet areas. So uh, you have to have them like in your kitchens and your bathroom and your outside at outlet. So any new construction, you get um, at least one of those in each of those rooms. Uh, I believe it's the same for... California because I have had my outlets in my bathrooms and my kitchen replaced anything close to water that's a mess, what right? the person said so there you go Kurt we're positive right. acting here in SoCal okay and Bill that was Ting T-I-N-G exactly and what was the name of the what is the name of the company Whistler Labs like in whistling like whistling yes thank you I just typed in Ting and State Farm and signed up for it in less than 60 seconds. For oh, free. you are too Very good. cool. I just yeah. looked up Ting and it didn't okay. find anything. The, the yeah. one thing that occurs to me after hearing your discussion of it, Bill, is that it sounds like it involves some communication between your house and somebody outside your house. And what I worry about under those circumstances is the extent to which it is encrypted because I don't want any third party able to come in and look at what's inside my house using some sort of hack. Um, I can't answer to that. I've had it for over a year. And so um, I don't really know, you know, how to... Um, address that but like i said it is um when i signed up for it they sent me a little device that actually plugs into my uh, wall socket and uh, but i didn't put any personal information in there other than i think an email address because um and my uh, wi-fi password so i can't really um address that i would suggest that you go to whistler labs and just you know look at the um the fine print but um i was comfortable with using it so but it does give me a good uh view of what's taking place and um it will prevent you know any kind of electrical fires that might be um caused from um a, a, a electrical a faulty um Hang on. I thought you said it was monitoring. You're telling me it's also a, a search protector or a short circuit protector? No, it's only monitors. It's only a monitor. 
so if you have state form, you just might, you know, like what they'll do with the person that uh, signed up for, they'll send him a device, you plug, you plug it into the wall, then connect it to your Wi-Fi, um, and then you can um, have it, um, the app is either can be on a smartphone or a tablet. The, I, I pulled it up and it says, Ting monitors the electrical network of a home using a smart plug in sensor to help detect hazards so they can be fixed before they had a chance to ignite. That's true. I think it only works with State Farm. I have farmers and it just says, hi there, let's give you some fire prevention tips. <laughs> Well, you can also subscribe to it, but I don't know what the subscription okay. costs. So, Jean Olson, it is your turn. Unmute yourself, please. I asked some questions in the chat, and they weren't completely answered. Uh, I guess the chat is not the right forum, excuse me. This is my first time. Um, I asked you to discuss options to protect ele electric equipment from spikes on cable TV and telephone lines. And you responded Ethernet, which is something entirely different. Well, what I want you, first of all, in, the home. I, my, in my own case, okay, in my own experience, um, I, I dumped cable and copper telephone service in 2002 when I went to optical service. Uh, optical service, at least as far as the wall on my, the outside of my house, uh, is immune to electrical power spikes. Uh, th there are devices on Amazon that can be used to connect uh, either copper cable or copper phone lines and is that what you mentioned now, Gene? Uh, yes. cable, cable and phone. I had uh, an electrical power strike uh, take out my television, my TiVo, and half the Comcast equipment in my house. Yeah, yeah. Set top boxes. I understand. Um, you can buy those on Amazon. I have not tried them, um, but they are available. So take a look. Okay, well, it's, it's an important issue for people that have that. Yes. And uh, the other thing, you didn't mention plugging all the equipment connected together with, you know, other means like uh, video lines, audio lines, stuff like that, all into um, the same power strip or the same surge protector so they all share the same ground. Well, very okay. Uh, two beat once, okay. Um, Given the fact that if you haven't tested your socket, you have no idea if there's a valid ground or not. It's invisible until you use a testing device. So uh, I did identify the uh, type of testing device in my presentation. And what I would say is that if you want to avoid that whole issue and the possibility of having to modify, having an electrician modify at high expense, over half of the power sockets in your home, it's easier and less expensive to have the, the electrician install a whole house surge protector for the electric lines. That will not impact, if you have copper cable or you have copper phone service, it will not impact any of those. It will not protect any of those. Uh, so uh, if you're concerned, if you have those services on copper cable, then you need to buy surge protection off of Amazon. Fortunately, you won't need an electrician to install those. You're missing the point. The point is if they're plugged into different sockets, um, if you have half Which your is, uh, no, I caught that point, Gene, and I said, get a whole house surge protector. This is a different issue. The issue is that you're assuming that all ground lines in your home are at the same potential. And that is not true in the case of a lightning strike. What will happen with a lightning strike is that it will draw so much current 
through different devices, that the ground potential of the different grounds on the different sockets can vary a lot. And if you have equipment plugged in that, that goes between two equipment on, plugged into different sockets, you can blow out the equipment through the difference in the ground potential uh, of those uh, lines. And I, thank I, you. I understand your point. The best thing you can do under those circumstances is to have them all plugged into the same socket as you described. Okay. Well, I mean, you didn't mention it, and it's very important. Thank you. I, I guess this was based on my personal experience, and I have not experienced that problem. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy Ting for $99. That's the device that Bill got for free, and you get a one year's worth of monitoring for free. Um, lifetime credit of $1,000 for hazard repair. So if you're interested, that's that. Gabe Goldberg, it's also, your Also, Judy, before you go, I, I looked up uh, on their facts. They give extensive um, uh, explanations of their security and pri privacy. The device itself does not talk back to the mothership. Right. And it says many times on their website, call your insurance agent directly. Yes. No, don't, don't pay attention to what you don't find on the internet. In other words, because according to the internet, the only company is State Farm. Who knows? Over to you, Gabe. Hi, thanks. Two quick comments on GFCI. One is the comment was made that a GFCI protects an outlet and everything downstream. That's important to know because at one point I noticed that the light didn't come on in our garage refrigerator because it had lost power. I checked all of our breakers and no breakers were, were, were tripped. I wandered around and found out that the GFCI in the bathroom on the other side of the wall from the garage refrigerator had tripped and that had turned off power to the refrigerator. So I had the outside outlet rewired so it was not subject to being turned off by the GFCI. So it's worth tracing circuits to find out what else will be turned off by the GFCI if it trips. And the other uh, comment is a tip to not install a GFCI with an audible alarm. I thought that would be a wonderful idea. We put one of those in our master bathroom. The problem is when the GFCI fails, when the outlet fails, you cannot turn off the audible alarm. And so it kept on chirping until we had an electrician replace that fancy GFCI with a non-fancy GFCI that would just trip but not make noise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Thanks for that information. Vitally important. Yeah, I haven't I haven't tried one of those audible alarm versions yet. I'm glad you mentioned that, Gabe. I'm not going to try it. <laughs> Joel, please unmute yourself. Okay, uh, two comments. First of all, the GFI doesn't protect against short circuits. It protects against current. Normally, if things are working right and you plug in an appliance, everything that comes out of the hot wire goes back to the neutral. What the GFI does is text detects a difference between those two, which means some of that current is going back through a ground, either through the ground and the outlet, which means it's a sh short in the appliance, or it's going through some person's body. And the difference is that the amount of current it takes to kill a person is considerably less than one amp. So it trips at a much lower level than a circuit breaker does because that's not its purpose. It's not its purpose to kill a high current is purposes to kill a current that is high enough to kill a person, which is a very low amount of current. Mm -hmm. So if you are touching the hot wire in some way and touching a pipe in your house, in your uh, kitchen or wherever, so that you were in contact with the ground, it doesn't take very much current to trip it. Um, and we've got the same issue that the, in our case, the ground fault allow, uh, outlet is in the garage and the refrigerator is on it. And it also is powering an outlet that's out on the front porch. And if we have a high enough uh, wind with rain, 
it gets enough water into that outlet on the front porch that it trips the ground fault and the refrigerator stops cooling. And if we don't notice it, it may be that way for a day. My, I, I, let me let me make a comment on this whole issue of what a GFCI does or does not do, how it protects you. The main reason I mentioned it in this presentation is to emphasize that light breakers, like fuses, it does not protect against a voltage spike reaching that GFCI or reaching the things that are connected to it or downstream from it. I can't claim any real expertise beyond that in GFCIs. And the other interesting thing, and I, I just looked up the, uh, um, what is it, the, the, the Ting thing, and the description of it is that Ting helps detect damaged wires and loose electrical connections that cause fires. What that tells you is that that device is detecting arcing because that sends out RF interference on your electrical lines, which can be picked up. Uh, and that's particularly an issue if you have aluminum wiring and have it going to outlets which are not rated for aluminum wiring, which makes it get loose just over time, even though nobody touches it. Uh, probably the odds of having a wire that actually had the cable damaged that had arcing in it is not very likely in most households, but uh, uh, that's basically what it does. It doesn't check for arbitrary things that might cause fires. It just checks for arcing, basically. Since you mentioned RF and the fact that it detects RF, I need to mention a situation that maybe other people are in. Uh, for many years, I lived uh, in this home. I was a block away from an AM FM transmitter site. <laughs> now, he's laughing because he knows what I'm going to say. Um, we bought a van in 1995 that had a uh, remote entry capability. In other words, it had a clicker on the key that would allow you to unlock the door of the car. And it didn't work. We took it back to the dealer. They changed the frequency by putting in a different module. It still didn't work. The dealer took the car to the driveway of the AM FM transmitter. And they swapped out frequencies until they found one that worked there. And yes, finally it worked at home. My point is that if you live in a, a suburban area with multiple radio sources nearby. I have to wonder how effective Ting can be because a lot of that radio comes into my house on the electric lines. It's just pick, uh, the electric lines let, act like an antenna and pick it up. So there's, I think, a limit to what Ting can accomplish under those circumstances. I would suspect that it probably looks for a splattering of RF all over sorts of frequencies rather than a a single frequency like you might have on an RF transmitter. So uh, it's probably the random nature of it that it may be signaling off of. I hope you're right. <laughs> that, 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 what does that require? Uh, fast Fourier transform? I don't really know. But uh, uh, it has to recognize that specifically. Maybe they use AI in that. Stoll Schumer, it is your turn. Uh, I want to thank uh, the presenters, as usual, um, very helpful presentations today. I do want to clarify a few things. Joel is absolutely correct about GFCIs and what their function is. So um, I would avoid the short circuit example that John put in his presentation in the future. It has nothing whatsoever to do with that. Well, uh, with, any, with any luck, I mean, the only... The only uh, presentation forums that I use anymore are my local club and APCUG's Wednesday workshop and Saturday safari. So I don't think I'll be presenting it again, but I thank you for that comment. Okay, next item is on that inexpensive outlet tester that you mentioned. It can read correct and still have no ground. It's called a bootleg ground. Ask your son about that. Don't do that, that's illegal, by the way, and it's not gonna help you with a surge protector. Um, the third thing I want to mention is on surge protectors, uh, a lot of devices say they're surge protectors when they're just power strips. You need to look at the information on the package 
there should be a voltage rating by UL, usually 330 volts. If it's like 400, 600, it's probably not going to do you any good. If there's no rating, it is a power strip. It is not a surge protector. And finally, I just wanted to respond when Pam was talking about difficulty trying to put a plug into a tamper-resistant newer style outlet that have the little flaps behind the flat uh, openings. Uh, you have to put in both prongs at this equal pressure at the same time, not angled, for the reason that was pointed out before. It keeps people, uh, kids, from just poking into one outlet at a time. They have to be done simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you, Saul. From San Diego to Huntsville, Alabama, Edward Kinney. It's your turn. That um, State Farm uh, Ting, that subscription it gave you is only for three years. And you have to pay for it after the three years. And uh, also, uh, does anybody know, is, are homes supposed to have a earth I've ground? I've longer than three years. Well, it, on the website, it, website it, may says, it may vary depending on how you acquire it. As Bill said, he acquired it through his home insurance company. And that may have lengthened the freebie aspect. Okay. Okay. Other thing, are homes supposed to have a copper rod earth ground? Yes. Current code. Yes, or a wire connected directly to a water pipe coming into the house. It would be a specifically a cold water pipe. That's the only kind we come in. I don't think I have ever had a hot water pipe coming into my house. <laughs> uh, Edward, I must say, I have uh, photographed that particular scene in, uh, in Huntsville at the Marshall Space Flight Center Museum. And the shuttle depicted has a very unique history. Yes, I, that... Uh... That's at the uh, U.S. Space and Rocket Center. On yes, and and that shuttle was built specifically for an exhibition in Japan. Its name is Pathfinder. Well, actually, it was built for Marshall Space Flight Center, who uh, was going to test the Enterprise shuttle uh, at the uh, at a test stand, and, in, and they drove that uh, article at. Well, they was built at the size of a shuttle, and they they pulled it around the center there to find where wires had been moved. And so Japan actually wanted an exhibit and they and one of the requirements for them to get that get that uh, pathfinder, they had to modify it to look like a real shuttle. So that when it got back the, the uh, they had that real looking uh, shuttle. So so Pathfinder was never a shuttle, it just looks like a shuttle. But anyways, uh they took down that exhibit uh, a few couple of years ago for refurbishment. I haven't been by there in a while, so I don't know if they got it back up there or not. Yeah, I'm trying to remember when I went down there. It was wintertime. I went and visited a friend of mine who lives in uh, southeastern Tennessee, and uh, he's, he grew up in Orlando. He's also a space fanatic like I am. And uh, I remember looking at that and thinking, which shuttle is that? And, uh, well, I found out. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, they, uh, they were going to test the Enterprise. The Enterprise shuttle never went into space. It, it, it did some drop testing, and did, actually did some drop testing and to test right. out the aerodynamics and everything. Right. But, but Hans would try to get the Enterprise, but the, uh, there was people ahead of it. So it's some, I think the Smithsonian or somebody got that one. Um, I will tell you that I remember ask a, an online discussion, this was pre-web, pre-internet days, it was on CompuServe, uh, when uh, Columbia, uh, now, the one that blew up coming off the pad, uh, when that thing was destroyed, uh, I asked a number of people if Enterprise could be made to fly, and it turns out its airframe was too non-standard. So they couldn't mount motors on it. And they never needed to because it was designed as a glider for landing tests. And indeed, they did that drop test. I remember one that I watched. Uh, they did the drop test over Edwards of Enterprise so they could test its glide characteristics. And the pilot said, well, it glides pretty much like a, 
a brick. Hmm. But yeah, it, uh, yeah, they determined uh, that the uh, it was too heavy, you know. So no, it was probably overbuilt, and so it's too heavy to, to, to you know to fly. So right. uh, they. Did. Right. Last comment about space shuttles. Pathfinder was built by Rocketdyne in my neck of the woods in SoCal. Pam Selby, it's your turn. Uh, yeah, my third question, I didn't get to finish, so you guys didn't answer my question. My question was, can I use that device you were talking about on the outside of my house to figure out where, wh between each plug, where the bad wiring might be in the GF? Um, whatever that thing was called, GFCI that keeps um, GFCI that keeps um, breaking. I have to reset. Will that device help me figure out which one's bad? You're talking about the two sockets on the GFCI. There's two uh, GFCIs have two three wire sockets. Look at Judy's picture or John Kennedy's no, picture. No, that's not what I'm saying. I've got okay. four different outside outlets that goes to that GFCI. Uh, when I try using something um, on the back side, it trips it. When mm -hmm. I use the same device in the front, it doesn't trip it. So there's something bad going on on the outside. I'm trying to figure out how to narrow it down, which one it is or where the problem is. The front outlet GFCI protected? Yes. Might I add here that the GFCIs do age, you may have to replace it. I did. We and you still it. have the same problem in the back? Yes. Then you've got a leak someplace where you're actually getting a ground fault. If it's, so, if it's with something like a compressor, okay, it may be because of the inductive loads that you get on a, on a device like that. In, in, in home wiring, now, just about everything needs to be GFCI or AFCI protected with the exception of, of circuits that do not have receptacles on them uh, and things that have motor, motor circuits on them, like your furnace or your air conditioner. Code does not require a GFCI on those. Because okay, but the device works in the front on all the outlets. So my, my question is, that device you were talking about I could buy at Home Depot, will that help me figure out where the problem is between the four outlets on the back? No. Oh, okay. No. Call an electrician. Bill Ginsburg. <laughs> Unmute yourself, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, originally... It was a ground fault interrupter. Now they've added a C, GF. Are they the same or what's going on? This is the point you're looking for. Let me. Uh... GFCI are essentially the same thing. The newest thing that has come out are AFCIs or combination devices. Arc fault circuit interrupters are are required uh, in places like bedrooms where you might have an electric blanket that's subject to, to having an arc. And a GFCI won't do you any, any good in that situation. But is there a difference between the original uh, ground fault interrupter and the ground fault uh, GFCI? No. The same thing. OK. I just want to say that everything at my house is plugged into a surge protector, no matter what it is. That includes my electric mattress pad, too. Uh, Joel Ewing is our last question or comment. I'm just going to add that most houses have been built in our area, at least in recent years, no longer have pipes going to the house. It's a PVC of some kind, which means you can't connect to the water main anymore and expect to have a good ground. I, I trust that the one in our house probably has the copper wire buried in the cement of the garage, but I uh, don't have any way to verify that. Uh, I'm not sure whether you really want to connect that to the gas main. I'm not really sure. I'd like a, a, a spike voltage going through the gas line. And of course, if lightning strikes in your immediate yard, all sorts of strange can happen. You can have 
arcs going through the plumbing in your house. My, yeah. my parents had uh, things got burned out when the uh, lightning strike in the backyard or nearby actually went through the tree roots and through the plumbing. So all sorts of strange things can happen. I, I want to make one more comment. Um, in the introduction, it explained that I made my career as a software engineer. Some of you may have already heard this old joke. How many software engineers does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is you can't do it because software, that's hardware. <laughs> and so you understand that my experience in this area is limited to the surges that I identified for you and my rather recent uh, and superficial understanding of GFCI. My main point again on GFCI was it will not protect, it will not protect you from surges. And for those of you who had the problem with your refrigerators in your garage, my light bulbs just burnt out. So, you know, <laughs> it's very simple with that. Anyway, and I'm going to ask John to bring up his presentation and share that slide so you all can get the link because there is nothing on the Pat Aces website that I could find where you can click on to request an invite to the presentation and I wasn't sure that the email address and my group's sharing meetings document was correct. Um, I will tell you, it is there, Judy. You have to go way, way down the homepage to find it. Okay. Um, however, uh, having said that, my, my, um, my purpose here is not to make your life more difficult it's to make it less difficult. And so I will be happy to share the slide again. Thank if, you. if I can get, oh, I know what's going on. I have to terminate the original presentation or either back step through it. Let's try okay. that. And I'm, I'm glad I didn't mention the um, email address that I have. I have the FFX meeting or the ARL meeting, which one it's uh, F it's FFX. Okay. FFX. Um, That's and, the one I have. And I will show you the slide here. I'll share it again now. There we go. Go ahead and scan the QR code. Or, or save it. Yeah, save it using a Windows or a Mac computer. Yeah, print screen. Windows key print screen is your best option. And all that information will be there for you. Why does the screen go gray? It just blinks. I'll let I you know it that blinks. it took a shot. Yep. That's the camera click. Yep. I, and I say it lets you know that it actually worked. And there are some that uh, programs will even make a click sound if you want it. Oh, that would be cool. Anyway, John and Huey. Thank you very much. Outstanding presentations, both of you. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us as all of our attendees that hung around through the bitter end of Q&A. John Kennedy, walk us off. Thank you all for joining us today. I will need to say that we had planned for a Saturday workshop next week, but due to health concerns or health issues, we're concerned that someone's having health issues, um, they are not going to be able to do it. And the uh, strike for the actors and writers out in California uh, seemed to have filtered across the country because we wouldn't couldn't not get anybody to write a presentation or do a presentation for Saturday. So we will not be back until the 30th. Uh, the Linux group took the month of August off because we do something every month. And then because of the Saturday Safari, we don't do a Wednesday workshop, so we have a little bit of a breather. So we are scheduled for an odd fifth Wednesday in August. So we will be back in three weeks. 
And that way you can now go to uh, John's presentation because otherwise I would have said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't go to John's presentation. We have a Saturday safari that day, but we don't, so you can. So those of you who um, um, have been here today, the follow-up material will come out at a future time. Don't expect it tonight, tomorrow. There's work that has to be done. As always, those of you who have done presentations for your club, you've already done it. You're an expert. Do it for us so we can share it with other, uh, other people. Uh, if you have ideas for topics, we can always use that. And then we have to find somebody who can do that. But uh, thanks so much.